Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Godan webinars. Uh, on behalf of the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar series. Uh, so today we have a, a very important webinar on farmers' rights on data and ownership issues. We have two experts on this topic uh, who are going to who I'll be introducing and who will be sharing their expertise and their, their work with all of us. Uh, and uh, I will also encourage all the uh, I will also welcome and uh, encourage all the participants to join in the discussion. So, so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our uh, speakers today. So we have two speakers. Uh, uh, the first one is Fatini Sampati from Godan. Uh, so Fatini is uh, based in Germany and works for the KTBL and supported by the German government. Uh, she is a legal professional with over 15 years experience. In the legal counsel, uh, counseling field, she studied law and holds a master's degree in the European Union law and European business law. Uh, Fotini serves as a legal expert supporting the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Initiative on ethical and legal aspects of open data. Uh, Fotini is responsible for the research and analysis of national and international legislation on open data and intellectual property study, and is an advisor on compliance and best practice across all aspects of national and European privacy and data protection law and regulation, GDPR especially, and international law in the agriculture sector. So welcome Fotini uh, to, and thank you for uh, spending, uh, able, be, being able to share your expertise with us today. So the next speaker we have is Simone. I would like to introduce Simone as well. Uh, Simone is from the uh, Wageningen Economic Research uh, 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 in Netherlands, and the goal of her research is to contribute to the shaping of research and technological and social innovation by means of enhancement of ethical reflection of stakeholders on its anticipated impacts on human social life. This approach to ethics contributes to more responsible decision making about innovation by making the values and interest of stakeholders explicit and facilitate their reflection and dialogue. Simone. Uh, Van der Berg is an experienced project leader and a researcher who published numerous innovation uh, trajectories, primarily in the healthcare domain. Uh, she is now expanding her research and interest in, to include the innovation and food uh, and farming. She is the co-founder and associate director of the Journal of Responsible Innovation and member of uh, co chem who advises the governments about uh, uh, ethical and societal aspects of genetic modification of uh, human beings, animals, and plants. So, it is uh, great to have uh, you know both of these expert speakers with us today. So, we will start off with presentation from Fotini, uh, who is going to share her uh, inputs and ideas on uh, on on this issue of farmers' rights on data and ownership issues. And then we will hand over to Simone and uh, later come back to the questions from all of you. So. Uh, I would like to hand this over to Fatini now. Fatini, so please take over. Thank you. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation, uh, Suhith, uh, Chipo, uh, Chris. Um, hi, Simone, and um, hello to all the participants. Uh, today, I will try uh, in my 10 minutes presentation uh, to introduce you uh, to farmers' rights on data and ownership issues. Um, so, I have to say that digital farming has uh, a lot of potential for uh, advancing agriculture and uh, giving farmers tools to be more productive and profitable. And although the benefits from uh, digitalization are multiple, farmers feel they are not the ones benefit from the value of data collected on their farms. So we need to ensure that farmers understand their rights to data and to have access to relevant data so they can harness benefits for uh, better farm decision management. The problem with data is that we generate too much data. Uh, we have volume, variety of data, velocity of data, veracity of data with uncertainty um, of data, uh, their origin. But the main question and the legal question uh, I could say is, what does it mean to own data? We talk about ownership. Um, so. It means that someone, an individual, a group, a business uh, can have 
proprietary interest. So when we talk about ownership, we talk about property rights. So the most important thing of property ownership is the right to control, remember this word, control the terms and con conditions of access to a resource. So the value of a resource is mostly intangible as with data. Ownership issues are governed more by IP rights, copyright, um, patents, and so on. So as I mentioned earlier, ownership as a legal concept is a little bit complicated. You can only own something if the law recognizes it as an ownership right. So what about ag data? Uh, ag data is not traditionally recognized type of property subject to ownership. Uh, ownership of intellectual property, uh, we can have, for example, we can own a patent, we can own a trademark, we can own uh, a copyright, but ag data doesn't really fit into these traditional uh, IP classifications. But still, if we can say um, the legal rights that are established ownership over data uh, is copyright, patents, as I mentioned earlier, plant breeders' rights, trade secrets, database rights. So in many cases, the most legal rights to data are owned by intermediaries that you know, invest in the selection of data. And the lack of uh, enforceable data rights owned by certain communities, such as the smallholder farmers, means that we could have inequality and, of course, marginalization. But even though there are all these issues and concerns about data rights and ownership issues, farmers and agribusinesses are more than willing to share data with each other. But we have to have some conditions. And we can build trust if these issues can be settled with the contractual agreements. So, so the general uh, data protection regulation uh, is a very good guide to develop guidelines for data processing and sharing. And a number of farm organizations have come together to develop a set of guidelines for sharing agriculture. The result? is the EU Code of Conduct on Agricultural Data Sharing by contractual agreement. It is known the EU Act Data Code. So what does this EU um, data, Act Data Code does? What are the main key concepts? So the first concept is about data originator, originator concept. It says that the farmer that produces data uh, from his farm has it, uh, the property of this data. The right of the data originator has to do uh, the right of the farmer to benefit for the use of the uh, data or also has the right to transfer data uh, with his consent. Another key point is the need for simple and understandable contracts. We need to have plain language so both sides can understand the terms and definitions. They can understand the purposes of the uh, access, use and share of data. They can also uh, understand their um, obligations, their rights, both parties, and uh, of course the mechanisms. Another key point is uh, encouraging pseudonymization. This is important because uh, it's a mechanism uh, that you can replace some fields in data with uh, identifiers so they're not so linked with personal identifiable uh, uh, information and that's different from anonymization with anonymization you can strip information and then the data originator is not linked with his um, uh, identity so another key concept is reducing unfair amendments to contracts that means that if you need uh, the contract to be changed, then of course the um, data originator should be informed and should give his explicit consent. And another important 
key concept is protecting a natural person's privacy. This means that if a company is starting to think of uh, elaborating um, uh, nat uh, natural person data, then the GDPR uh, will apply because we have personal data. So another thing is that in uh, the USA, we have a similar um, ag data core principles like the EU uh, code ag data. And of course, there is also the ag data transparency seal. What does it mean? Uh, the general principle is that farmers own the data created on their farms. This is the main uh, principle. Ownership as a legal concept, as we said, is more complicated. And ownership means nothing if the farmer has no control. After establishing the core principles, uh, the collision of farm groups and ag technology created the ag data transparency seal for certification. That means that ag technologies should answer to uh, 10 questions uh, if they comply uh, with these uh, principles. So what about IP rights? Intellectual property rights uh, grant controls to data creators and maintainers. They are invented so to encourage people to innovate it by ensuring mostly that they can benefit financially from the intangible assets they create. So more traditional IP uh, rights tend to expire after a period of time during which you could imagine that the creator has received adequate rewards for this investment, but database rights are designed to reward ongoing maintenance and curation of the intangible asset. Let me talk to you about the data protection rights. The data protection rights control uh, individuals to allow or prevent the collection and use of data. They are designed to enforce human rights, the right of privacy, and the aim is to protect citizens and consumers to also reduce bad use of data and bias. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the most recent data protection um, regulation is the GDPR. So what about farmers' rights? Farmers' rights, some of them are rights of access, use and share. This means that the data provider is responsible for making data uh, available to the data originator. Also, uh, they have the right of portability, the right to have the data transmitted directly from one data user to another when it's technically feasible, unless, of course, it's stated otherwise in the contract. They have also the right to remove, destroy, return data to the data originator. And, of course, the right to information, the right to benefit from their uh, data. But the question is how these rights should be implemented and protected by making uh, policy changes in national, regional and international level to support farmers' rights to data information and knowledge. Of course, we need to increase awareness of small for, uh, holder farmers. We need to educate and empower uh, farmers. Uh, they need to know the value of the data that they are producing and sharing. And of course, we should include farmers' representatives in the development of farm data standards and in decision making about data and information. And one most important thing as a requirement is farmers' informed consent. Farmers should be informed about the purpose of access use and sharing of data from the companies so he would be able to consent or, of course, he would be able to say no or to withdraw his consent at every point uh, he wants. So that's pretty much um, talking about the ownership and the data rights and farmers' rights. I know it's uh, short, uh, but uh, I think with the, our conversation, I would be able to answer to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patini. I think you uh, gave a very, very good background and context of the work. Uh, and it really is very helpful to have that context in the discussions later. So we will come back to you uh, after uh, Simone's presentation. Now I want to give the floor to Simone to share her ideas and uh, uh, work on this. Thank you, Simone. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I would like to talk to you about data ownership and trust in data sharing. Uh, I'm part of a large 
European project, so I don't know a lot about the rest of the world, <laughs> uh, about the developing world, so I depend on you very much to give me that kind of input. Um, so um, I wanted to start with one of the, well, to, to a list of challenges for the 21st century. Um, and um, because smart farming, so the di digitalization of farms is um, presented very often uh, to con as a way to contribute to realizing these shared goals. So um, we know that the population grows, uh, there are more mouths to feed, so the product production needs to go up. Uh, we have climate change and we have to diminish the environmental impact of farming. Uh, we have to foster safety and social acceptance of food products and digitalization is presented as a way to attend to these goals, to attend to these challenges. So I wanted to start with that because we, uh, when we talk about ethics, the discussion often narrows down and that's a little bit understandable also because if we look at farming and the production of food uh, and you look at all the different parties who are involved in the digitalization of that um, then you see that these are all companies which are not particularly uh, concerned with these large uh, shared goals so they easily lost out of scope and I think it's important to keep that in mind when we frame the ethical discussion. So, um, and these are the two challenges that uh, Chipo and Sushit uh, gave me, uh, gave us prior to this webinar. Um, you see here that there are two challenges and uh, the shared goals are, um, uh, are uh, resumed here to gain access to relevant data and services provided by others. So this is a challenge for smallholder farmers in a large part of the world. However, most attention goes to making sure that any data shared does not actually weaken their positions of the smallholder farmers. So both are very important, but very often in the ethical discussions, we lose out of sight the first challenge and focus very much on the second one. And um, so these are some of the questions asked by CTA to start a discussion, which are all wonderful um, and you see that the red questions about ownership about data protection about the role of privacy is very much about the second challenge and uh, the blue ones are about these shared goals so who is entitled to the value of the data and what should be done to include farmers in the mechanisms of data uh, data collection data evaluation and transmission and use so um, I want to show that these are very different goals and we should keep that in mind and not focus too much on the red goals and keep in mind also the blue ones. So um, now about uh, the language that we often use to talk about ethics related to data. Very often we speak about privacy. Privacy is a word that is often used also in connection to farm data. However, privacy often uh, mostly concerns personal data. So although the farm business and farm household is often seen as one and the same economic unit, um, yeah, uh, talk about privacy um, in the end um, is maybe not really fitting when we talk about smart farming because the data there are usually not considered personal. So, um, Another word that is used a lot is data ownership. Well, Fotaini in a previous uh, presentation has shown already a little bit how this term is very difficult, a difficult legal term, um, and that uh, different regulation is useful and offers a useful guide, but also a limited guide to think about what is at stake here. So um, can we think about data as, uh, as property? That's quite difficult because usually what is characteristics about, uh, about property is that it's exclusive. So if you have a house or if you have land or if you have a cow, it belongs to you. And if it belongs to you, it doesn't belong to somebody else, to your neighbor or to your father or to somebody else. So, and this is not the case really with farm data. 
farm data, you can own data, and at the same time, the data can be used by other people. So um, data are not exclusive in the same way as um, the ownership of a house or a cow is exclusive. So this is a little bit problematic, and I want to show in this way that the uh, the term ownership is something that used to play an important role in our way of talking about what is at stake in farming, right? But here, maybe data ownership is not completely the appropriate term to use. It can um, fulfill some roles for us, but it also has limitations. It's a kind of heritage we have from a previous moral world, and um, which makes it also difficult to understand what this specific, when we speak about data, which actually acquire more value uh, when we share them with each other and less value when we keep them for ourselves. Whereas if you keep uh, a cow for yourself, you enjoy it, uh, its benefits. And uh, if you give it, if you share it with others, maybe uh, <laughs> you will have less. So, um, um, so what is said in some of the ethical discussions is that talking about data as property is not really fitting. And uh, farm data, as Fotaini explained, do also not fit completely into IP classifications as a trademark or copyright. Um, however, um, when you think about the technologies and algorithms to interpret uh, uh, the data, then they can be protected more in this way and by means of IP classifications. So what is often said is that farm data could be understood as a kind of trade secret. However, this is also a little bit problematic because there's no international regulation to protect a trade secret. So this offers a way to think about it and to think what is at stake here for the individual farmers, but it doesn't really offer a lead to protect people. So um, when you think about different ways to protect uh, ownership, uh, you can look at uh, these principles that are developed by the American Farm Bureau, um, which uh, uh, focus on contracts and uh, contracts between uh, farmers and uh, the ATPs, so the agriculture technology providers. So uh, you see there that uh, ATPs can collect, assess and use farm data with explicit consent from farmers, which is done in these contract agreements. And uh, the ATPs have the responsibility to inform farmers and create accessible contracts. And the farmers continue to be the owners of non-aggregated farm data. However, you might ask the question, who is the owner of the aggregated data and what can be done with them? Uh, does it also make something explicit about those? So, and the other one that uh, Fotaini spoke about, and she called it the uh, AH uh, data code, um, uh, is the Copacocheca code. And they also focus on shaping a contract a contact agreement between parties interacting with the data. So their data ownership rights are ascribed to the data originator who has created or collected data by technical means um, or who has commissioned other people like data providers for this purpose. And processes of data from various sources who deal with aggregated data are not the originators or owners. So it makes very explicit who counts as an owner. Um, and sharing conditions should be agreed on in a contract. So here also the focus is on a contract. And in this contract, you acknowledge the right of all parties to protect sensitive information. Um, it recognizes the right of the originator to benefit from or be compensated for the use of their data. Um, and so the contract agreement should clearly state what the benefits are of data use for the originator. So the originator should know what the benefits are. And uh, in the contract, lots of things have to be made explicit. So it has to specify the terms and definitions, the purpose of collecting the data, of sharing them and processing them, 
the rights and obligations that parties have related to the data, the information on how data are stored, verification mechanisms for the data originate, and the last one is really interesting. It has to uh, have transparent mechanisms for adding new or future uses. So you have to be rather explicit about all the ways in which you're uh, using those data or probably use them in the future or think about how you make explicit to the data originator uh, what you're going to do with them with those data for example five years after you gathered them so the presupposed values in these contracts are uh, transparency and a specific version of trust so trust is here understood as a relationship in which an agent the truster decides to depend on another agent's, the trustee's foreseeable behavior in order to fulfill his expectations. So there's an explicit decision to depend on the other person. Um, and uh, the decision depends on the information uh, that is shared with the person who decides. So it's a kind of informed consent there. You give the information and the person consents um, uh, to give his data, to do the things with it that uh, are made explicit by the user. So uh, explicit uh, way or transparent way of uh, uh, yeah, making clear what you do with the data. Well, having said this, my role is to be an ethicist. So it's to ask uh, critical questions about this and to expand the discussion a little bit. So critical questions are, for example, is it feasible to make everything you intend to do with data explicit in a contact, contract? Do you know beforehand everything you want to do? So data originators and owners are diverse. How do you make information accessible to everybody. So um, the data originators may be located in different parts of the world. They may speak different languages, have uh, different levels of education. They might expect you to do other things with their data. So the expectation may be very div diverse and it may be difficult to really understand each other in all situations. So um, that might complicate matters. And the second thing is, can you already foresee everything you would like to do with the data in the future? Can you make that explicit in a contract? And is it possible or feasible or desirable to recontact data originators to ask for consent for new users? So this is uh, made explicit in the uh, Copa Cocheca uh, Code of Conduct that you, um, you have to have a way to uh, inform the data originators about new things that you're going to do with the data. But it's that feasible always if you have lots of farmers that offer you data and um, you have combined them all and interpreted them. Is it possible to recontact them to ask to use the data for new purposes? Um, some more critical questions. Is it sufficient to make everything you intend to do with data explicit in a contract? So do you have it all covered then? It does not give any responsibility to grant every farmer access to data and its services. So extra efforts are demanded to foster participation and inclusiveness and empowerment. And this is especially the case when you think about the goals uh, for which data are used. So please think back um, to the shared 21st century challenges that this um, uh, digitalization is expected to serve and think about whether um, this contract uh, is giving any promises about whether these goals are reached, yes or no. So I think this is left out of scope in these contracts and we should be talking about them too. So it should be included in the ethical conversation what data are being, uh, uh, for what goals data are being used and whether they're actually contributing to realizing um, the, yeah, the, to facing the 21st century challenges and to helping us to uh, overcome them. So um, that is um, the questions that I would like to ask you and I'm really interested to hear your uh, input. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Simon. Uh, very interesting presentation, and you shared a lot of ideas and a lot of questions, actually. You know, and thank you for raising some of these ethical questions, which I think are very important that we raise them and uh, have some good discussions and the wider community uh, to share these ideas as well. So let me also uh, take this opportunity to uh, call all the participants who are joined our uh, webinar to please uh, ask your questions or share your ideas. So I can see some of the questions that are coming in. So please do put your questions in the chat window so we can uh, ask to the experts we have today and they will be happy to answer your questions and uh, and uh, uh, one by one. So let me start off uh, with, with a question to both Simone and uh, Fotini because you know you, you both mentioned about uh, the issue of you know how to empowerment and how to make especially smallholder farmers. So from your experience, do you you know what do you think uh, might be some of the practical steps that uh, maybe awareness creation for uh, for this issue on data rights and ownership for uh, specifically for the smallholder farmers and you know for example in the developing world. So do you have any ideas or examples you'd like to share with? So maybe I first ask Fotini. Fotini. Oh. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, uh, I think one way and the most important way is with education and uh, training uh, smallholder farmers. Um, we are, uh, there are also some um, uh, seminars, I could say, I could say, or also uh, some uh, agricultural uh, colleges and also uh, Godan, I have to mention. Uh, is doing a very good uh, work on uh, informing uh, farmers about their uh, rights, about policies and everything. I know it's not so... Uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry, I saw a blank. Uh, I know that it's not easy, uh, for example, in developing countries, uh, this communication and training uh, is uh, being uh, held uh, by uh, radio uh, because uh, you, they don't have the, the means. Um, uh, there are many people illiterate, but uh, I think that also uh, farmers' organizations uh, could educate more uh, farmers and raise uh, awareness. I think these are the first uh, steps, most practical steps uh, to be informed, uh, farmers be informed and uh, aware of their rights and the practices thank you for Dini. uh simon uh, do you have anything to add on that uh, any, any no i think i completely agree and i wonder whether um well uh, the copacochica code of conduct um whether it's also well known in developing countries and whether people are using that as well or not uh, or if it's only a european thing so i was wondering if it's useful there at all or not uh, can I uh, ask uh, answer? Yeah, yeah, yes, please go on. Yeah, I think um, that it's not so well known. Um, as you can imagine, anyway, the EU code of conduct of uh, Copa Cochega is new. And uh, I think maybe in Europe is not so well known. Uh, so, so you can imagine in developing countries. Uh, but for example, there are also uh, different uh, initiatives like uh, the um, Farm Bureau uh, core principles in USA. Um, and for example, in Kenya, uh, there are some bills on uh, data protection, as far as I know, and uh, about agricultural professionals. There is a first step of being uh, more informed and having more qualifications. There are some few steps, uh, but still it's the, the beginning. The good thing is that, for example, with the GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, as I mentioned earlier, uh, provides um, a guide, a guide that you can uh, work on it, you can base on it. As you can see, uh, both EU Code uh, um, of Conduct of Copa Cogeca and the USA Core Principles are based actually in uh, the, the GDPR. Uh, so it's a very good, uh, it's a very good start. Mm -hmm. But I have also to mention, uh, because um, it wasn't mentioned uh, till now, that both these um, core principles and EU codes of contact are not binding. I think that you should mention that. They, it's not legislation, but 
of course, it's a very, very good step for having mm. afterwards maybe um, legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Fotini yeah. and Simone. Uh, very good uh, inputs from that. So now, if, if, with your permission, I would like to go to the questions that is raised by our participants. So we have so many questions that are coming in. So I will try to go oh, through one by one some of them. So uh, <laughs> Ulf Malson, uh, who is asking, how can a farmer enforce that the proposed agreements, such as Copa Cogina, Cogica, is honored by the companies, except refusing to buy their equipment? So is, do you have any suggestions for you know how how right. um, how these are honored by the companies. Uh, this, for example, the Copa Cogigna is honored by companies. Yeah, well, it's a it's a code of conduct. So yeah. uh, it means that people can use it when they think it's useful, and they can mm -hmm. leave it aside if they don't want it. Um, so uh, it has no uh, yeah, <laughs> it has no legal status. Okay. Uh, but you can, of course, bring it to the conversation table and you can say uh, to the negotiation table and you can say, well, I'd like to work with you, but I'd like to work with you according to these standards, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let me go to the next question uh, from Ronald, uh, who is asking, what is the current state of ag data code for non-EU and USA countries? So, uh, what is the current state of ag data code for any non-EU country? Do you have any idea on that, Patini or Simon? Uh, what what exactly? Um, I didn't understand the question. Yeah. So the question uh, is, question is asking the you know, the ag data code, which is EU EU based uh, code, right? The ag data yes. code. Yes. So, yes. Uh, does uh, it have code. any? Uh, how does it uh, how does it transfer for any non-EU countries? You know. So. Uh, yeah, that was my question, question actually. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> uh, there's no need, uh, for example, to transfer it because it's a, U, uh, it's a code of contact. So that means, and actually it's for an EU code of contact, that means has to do with um, European uh, general, but uh, like the USA or in developing countries, that doesn't mean that you can develop uh, agribusinesses with farmers that can uh, develop together uh, this EU, uh, this uh, codes of conduct. It's a guide based on legislation like GDPR, but if not, we have these presidents, these two presidents with Copa Cogeca and uh, the Farm Bureau uh, core principles that developing countries can be based and they have they have to have a collaboration with agribusinesses via, uh, in my opinion, for example, NGOs or uh, farmers organizations, and they can sit all together like in USA or uh, like these uh, 37, if I remember correctly, or maybe less, maybe, uh, less in Europe, uh, uh, agribusinesses that said, okay, we have to do something about farmers and their rights and their um, security. So, it's a very good guide. Uh, all we need is to make it more, how can I say it, uh, furthermore uh, um, uh, aware that there are these co uh, codes of conduct and that uh, other countries uh, should um, use them based, of course, to their needs, their culture, um, and maybe their political uh, views, I don't know. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's a very, very good start because you know for sure that, okay, agribusinesses, uh, no matter how big they are, uh, they came at the table like uh, Monsanto, DuPont, and said, yes, we should think more about farmers. Uh, it's a very good step. Uh, I know that a lot has to be done, but you have the structure, you have, um, you know, the, the, the skeleton of these contracts, uh, that they are trying to be more fair. For example, in Australia, uh, they have legislation, it's a very new legislation about contract and the, affair, the unfair and un unlawful terms of contracts. And uh, they really, really um, help farmers to be more aware of the terms uh, with plain and simple language, uh, with uh, their consent. These are important issues uh, to be considered. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I... Being, I'm being optimistic, to tell you the truth. And I think, yeah, yeah it's a very, very good start. 
Yeah, but I um, uh, I think also that it might give a very good starting point. But I think that um, um, it also matters to remain very sensitive to the moral language and the sensitivities that are in place in a specific cultural context. I mean, I've spoken to um, uh, African people during the Godam meeting in Bonn or in Cornish winter, and uh, they were telling me that lots of farmers there are not willing to share their data with um, large international corporations, but they were very interested to share them uh, with other people within their village or in uh, neighboring villages, for example. And so to shape these kinds of communities um, uh, that are similar to the communities that they're working in, um, in already actually um, that um, facilitates it and it takes away barriers to uh, to do this. So um, so I can imagine that you uh, you would have to look in a specific context to see how people think about these issues and to what kind of morality that is already in place you could connect in order to make it acceptable to the different parties uh, to share data. Uh, of course, you're right about it, uh, Simone. And uh, in my opinion, uh, first, uh, you have to start with the ethical issues and questions, then to develop policies and then uh, legislation. Because legislation, in my opinion, is nothing more uh, uh, than the need of these uh, ethical questions and issues that have arisen. Um, then the law, uh, having considered all this uh, above that you mentioned, uh, is going to have the law and the structure and say, okay, uh, this is about what we do about unfair contracts, uh, this is what we do in case of uh, data breach and everything. Of course, it's important to take into consideration the ethical issues. And also in uh, developing countries, um, you know, farmers, um, are not so reluctant uh, to, uh, you know, uh, give access to their data for the big agribusinesses. Yes, that's also true. But sometimes are also uh, are not aware uh, and not well informed uh, with their own um, uh, agri um, agricultural professionals. So it has to do everything with information and knowledge because. In uh, these countries, uh, for example, um, an agri agricultural professional will go and ask the farmer about a plant variety, a new plant variety, and then the farmer will give his data and he won't be aware of uh, the lack of his data because most probably the agricultural uh, professional will uh, go and say afterwards, okay, I'm the originator of this new uh, plant variety. So there are a lot of issues to be uh, considered, a, a lot of moral and ethical issues. Um, that's why I mentioned earlier that there are some legislation um, about um, in agriculture but it's not really shaped and not really really um, concerned so much uh, the, the farmers uh, but if we are all having this discussion in general if we're trying to inform farmers if we try to educate and uh, uh, um, raise awareness, then I think that uh, they should consider more when someone comes and asks for their uh, data, for example. Uh, I think it has to do, as I uh, earlier said, with information. How can we inform uh, farmers? Mm. Thank you both. Uh, we no have a lot of questions coming in, so uh, <laughs> if you may permit, uh, I would like to move to uh, the next questions as well. I don't think we will be able to uh, uh, answer all the questions because there are more than 20 questions already uh, coming in but i will try to uh, go through uh, the ones yeah. we can in the next 15 minutes so gunashekara lamsal is asking is it possible for all the data to be open for smallholder farmers too if so how can we do well, this Simon? that's really well, that's really something that I think we should be considering because now um, uh, sharing data is an affair between individual parties, right? The ATPs and the farmers and uh, uh, the different um, service providers and, um, and they agree on the terms. Um, 
yeah, at their own negotiation table. But you might be asking, like, is this the way in which we can actually realize these societal goals? Huh? And it might be that farmers have their own reasons uh, to want to do research on data or to get information from data. And you might be thinking also about that uh, as storing them in a kind of library uh, in the way we have biobanks, for example, that have uh, tissue, uh, human tissue, uh, which is to be reused for uh, research. And um, you might think in a similar fashion about um, agri data that you store in different agri banks, agri data banks, and that uh, different stakeholders could take out to use for uh, a variety of purposes. And of course, this is very sensitive, so we have to think about what the preconditions would have to be for this data sharing and data use. But um, uh, yeah, in similar fashion as we do that for biobanks as well. But this would at least be an idea worth considering, I think, to um, yeah, to to make this these data accessible to a variety of actors, for example, farmers or farmers' organization, but also uh, policymakers or NGOs or uh, maybe some companies. But you have to think about the types of restrictions that you would then want to install, because at this at present, if we organize this data sharing in these little groups of people that are uh, agreeing and uh, signing their own contracts and uh, agreeing on the terms of, of their data sharing, um, then you also make a lot of, um, you also create a lot of impossibilities for people to reuse data for societal purposes. Uh, for example, to look at uh, what developments are uh, that uh, review climate change, for example, eh? and so and to uh, convince the public that it's actually taking place and that it's demanding us to uh, undertake action, for example. So um, I think it would be worth considering at least what um, whether this would be an attractive idea to uh, have these data together as a kind of library and to consider whether what would be the 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 uh, the regulation or, yeah, that would have to govern these data banks because it would make it accessible to a larger variety of people. But at the same time, we have to think about how to how to protect the interests of the people who are involved. So. Yeah, thank you, Simone. Yeah. Any uh, <laughs> thoughts on this? Virginia? Well, I totally agree uh, with uh, Simone and the idea of these uh, libraries, data banks and repositories or uh, platforms, platforms uh, are very, very good uh, in order to be more uh, accessible and in order to contribute to uh, benefit sharing, uh, sharing or uh, innovation. But of course, um, every coin has two sides, both sides, so we should also consider not only uh, the benefits but also the, uh, the restrictions uh, like um, Simone uh, correctly mentioned. Um, so yes, um, it's, it's, it's nice to working to this, um, how can I say, uh, direction or with, um, with data banks. For example, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, so let me go to the next question from Mel Melchior Abor, who is asking. Uh, I, I think this uh, again a, a important question because uh, most farmers in developing countries are not well schooled or you know maybe illiterate. So then how then will they be able to control how their data is used? So do you have any ideas or suggestions? So you know how, for example, smallholder farmers in developing countries. Who might not even have, you know uh, uh, are not literate or you know are not educated you know how will they uh... yeah well that's that's one of the limitations of this contract way of dealing with things right so um, uh, if you say we're going to solve issues by um, um, yeah, by um, signing a contract together and one of the parties is unable to read it um, then yeah, then it's not a useful tool, I think. That's a serious limitation. Yeah. 
Um, in my opinion, you can deal with that uh, through um, farmers association that uh, they should be more uh, trained and more informed and maybe they uh, would uh, as the representatives of farmers they could act of, on behalf of them and then probably they could read the uh, the, the um, use of terms of the contract uh, and uh, of course uh, as i also mentioned earlier in developing countries uh, one way is still radio i know it's a little bit um, not strange, but still, uh, radio is sometimes the only way uh, farmers to be uh, informed, um, where there might be no uh, access to internet. But at some other countries, also in developing countries, uh, this could be done uh, via uh, the mobile phones and apps, and. Um, these apps are very good because uh, they inform farmers, uh, for example, uh, where uh, or uh, when uh, to, to, to plant and uh, they can have their uh, crops. Uh, so it's, I would say uh, that uh, this is something that uh, it's, been, uh, it's been done in Kenya. Uh, for example, um, uh, women, um, that most of them are farmers, um, um, a number of them is using this uh, mobile and uh, then uh, one another are trying to uh, inform uh, in, in some groups and have trainings and uh, to inform them how this uh, functions, how this works. Uh, I know it sounds a little bit strange that, um, as I said, we need to empower farmers with these tools in general because technology is advancing and it could work also in uh, developing countries via also governments and we shouldn't forget governments. For example, we are talking about NGOs and farmers associations, but still we can't forget governments to help farmers uh, to have access in the, on their data and everything and benefit from uh, the sharing of, da of data. Thank you, Simon and Fatina. I think Fatina, you made a really good point on, uh, you know, uh, non-digital means of communications like radio, uh, you know, and other print media, and you know, other other kind of tools, a voice-enabled uh, phone phone kind of SMS with voice-enabled services, especially very important for uh, because many of the smallholder farmers in the developing world are. Uh, not educated and uh, uh, so these kind of uh, other other modes of communication to uh, to for awareness creation and for them to also know this information is very important and so we should mm -hmm. not forget the importance of these non-traditional uh, yes. non-digital kind of means of uh, tracing awareness as well so thank you for uh, raising this and bringing to the attention as well so we have so many questions but we have we are we, we have we'll yeah. take one more question uh, because I wish the, people could uh, join in. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, just, we'll take one more question, but for the people who are answered the questions after this webinar, uh, our colleagues in CTA will compile all the questions you have asked and uh, we will send it to the presenters and then we'll have the discussions. Uh, uh, we'll send the answers later to the uh, good and capacity development working group. So, you know, so we can make sure, you know, your ideas uh, and all the interesting questions uh, can be taken forward for more discussion. So if you have any other questions, you know, you are more than welcome to raise this at the uh, capacity development working group uh, mailing list. You are all welcome to join the good and capacity development mailing list and, you know, continue the discussion. So uh, one more questions we would like to take, I, will, I think I can take now is from a question from Kenya, actually. I think so from Nuru Kipato, who is asking, the issue of contracts from the Copa Kogigina Code of Contracts and other contracts, is it feasible to have written contracts with farmers? A study in Kenya showed that most farmers preferred verbal agreements, consent rather than written cons consent, as the latter seemed they were signing something off and made them uncomfortable. So any, any thoughts or any kind of feedbacks on this kind of uh, uh, in, uh, inputs from, from Nuru Kipato's question? Well, um, similar to what we said earlier, maybe. Um, 
that contracts um, might not fit in every context, right? Um, and it might be difficult for some people. And um, I think a verbal agreement um, is okay in a lot of circumstances, but if you uh, want to make clear what types of future uses you want to make of data, and you don't have it anywhere written on paper, then everybody can say, then the other party can say afterwards, yeah, we agreed on that. <laughs> and you can never check it anymore, right? So, um, so I'm not really, yeah, it has limitations. I can understand that people are not comfortable with a written contract, but also a verbal contract in these kind of circumstances where there are international parties involved and data are probably stored for, for decades, um, then it's, it's going to be a little difficult to not have anything stored, huh? not have any agreement stored about that. So, um, um, yeah, I think a verbal agreement has, in that sense, some limitations, although I can understand that um, a written contract, um, yeah, faces difficulties in some contexts too. So, um, um, yeah, maybe in those circumstances, it would be more fitting to to organize uh, data sharing in a different way, for example, in a regional way amongst people who know each other and who can remember other, their other parties that they've given their word, right? And they have um, come to agreements. Whereas the more abstract parties, uh, the large companies that are elsewhere in the world, then it's um, probably rather difficult to work in this way. So maybe in those contexts, a local organization of data sharing would be more fitting. Yeah. Thank you, Simone. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, about uh, oral agreements, I'm not so sure in developing uh, countries. Um, I would promote, if possible, if possible, I say again, uh, the written terms. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, this could be uh, done uh, not with so uh, with the farmers that they may be uh, not aware of it. Uh, they are not well educated, uh, but uh, it could be done through um, NGOs and uh, farmers associations. And of course, uh, a contract uh, should has um, uh, specific terms. And about the future use, also, I think that um, in a way you can minimize it because um, if you uh, play a role in negotiating the terms, then you can uh, say uh, the purposes of um, of data collected uh, for uh, the purpose, yeah, uh, for how long the use. Uh, or maybe it could be on the contract that, for example, I'm saying now, uh, like I'm thinking like now, uh, that, uh, for example, after uh, two years, maybe it would be um, a, renewal, a renewal of, uh, of the contract. Uh, this could, uh, could work if you want to check more uh, agribusinesses, if they comply uh, with everything. But still, I have to mention that um, contracts and everything and codes of conduct, uh, unfortunately, uh, isn't a law and a legislation. Uh, it would be best if we promote it, uh, having a soft legislation or uh, something. Uh, but as I uh, mentioned earlier, um, it's a good uh, uh, beginning with, uh, with contracts. And I, I've seen um, also in um, Australia, USA and in uh, Europe that we are having this. Uh, we are having the contracts uh, are being made more fair. And that's very good. Uh, this is what we want for the farmers. So I think we can we can work on it more. Thank you, Fitoni, Fitoni, and thank you, Simone. I think it is you, both of your presentations and the ideas you presented are, uh, are really important, and it raised a lot of very important questions, and especially the ethics and uh, uh, of smallholder farmers. And I really uh, appreciate your uh, inputs for this uh, webinar. For the from on behalf of Godan, I want to thank you both for sharing your ideas and inputs with us today.
uh, i also want to thank all our participants they have asked so they have been really uh, participatory and asking so many important questions and we will try to make sure all these questions though we couldn't answer within the one hour time frame because uh, we had so many interesting questions but little time but we will try to get these questions uh, debated in our uh, capacity building book group later so you're, you know we will have, try to make sure these are recorded and try to have these discussions later and we have these experts with us so they will hopefully we, they can provide their ideas and feedbacks as well so i want to thank again all of you who joined us from all over the world today who have joined us for this webinar and we look forward to your active contributions for the godan capacity development working group and your ideas uh, to join this community for godan and having you involved in our activities for the future so i want to thank again the speakers and all of you for for your thank participation you. today thank you very much thank bye. you thank you bye bye, -bye. bye.